I want to thank everyone for coming to the master class webinar that we're having taking place today. Our guest today is Dr. Alex Clark, and he'll be speaking on the topic of Get Your Methods Paper Published, Insights from the Editor's Office. I'll just give a quick one through of how the webinar will work. Dr. Clark will give his presentation, and at the end there'll be time for questions. If you raise your hand, I can give you the microphone. If you don't have a microphone, then you can write your question in the chat box, and then we'll read out the questions for you. Um, so we'll go get started with the introduction for Alex Clark. Alex Clark is Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods and has editorial and review roles for numerous other international journals. His research draws on complexity theory to research aspects of heart disease. It has been published in some of the world's most influential journals, including the British Medical Journal, Heart, Social Science and Medicine, The Lancet, Journal of Advanced Nursing and Sociology of Heart and Illness, this work uses qualitative and quantitative methods, includes systematic review, and incorporates theory. For his contrib contributions to the development of young scientists across discipline, he was recognized in 2011 as World Economic Forum Youth Global Leader. He chairs the IIQM Advisory Board. This series is brought to you in conjunction with Thank you, Pat. Um, and University. Welcome. Alex, you can go ahead. Thank you, Yvette. And uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone to this Atlas TI IIQM Methods Masterclass Series, Get Your Methods Paper Published, Insights from the Editor's Office. And here I am in Canada at lunchtime sitting in my office, and I'm going to share with you today some insights from my experience as Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods editor of Open Nursing, John Wiley's Open Access Journal and the Canadian Journal of Nursing Research and as a reviewer for many, many journals over the years. If you're interested in any follow-up questions, as Yvette says, there'll be time at the end of the webinar and I'd be really interested to hear your comments and questions then. Um, if you've got questions after the webinar, when this uh, webinar is posted up on the YouTube, um, please, you can send me an email to the address there, alex.clark at uolberta.ca, or indeed, send me a direct message or a message on the Twitter. Now, um, very grateful for Atlas TI and IQM providing this opportunity today to really share with you some of the insights about publishing methods. And I'm a degree conflicted here because, of course, I love writing about research methods, and I'm also involved in editing um, a journal in relation to qualitative methods in my role as editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Qualitative Methods. This is an interdisciplinary journal that's open access, publishes a diverse range of papers, really focusing on quality and influence. Um, and it's in relation in particular to my experiences involved in this journal over the years that I'm going to draw on today. That's enough about me. This session is really all about you. It's about your passion, your excitement for methods, sharing your ideas, wherever you are in the world, um, with the qualitative research community, with the mixed method research community, uh, in a way that you can then take your ideas, take the burning issues you have around your methods, and turn them into papers, turn them into knowledge translation products that are really helpful for other people, that give them insights, that get you influence and can really make a difference and make a methods difference for people all around the world. And this is why methods papers I think are so important and indeed journals that publish methods are so important and still have a place in this busy world. And today we're going to focus on what we can do to help you increase your chances, not only of writing a good paper, but of getting that paper accepted, and also ensuring that that paper is as helpful as it possibly can be for the community, for the readers all over the world, not only helping them with their research, but also helping you with your reputation. And we're going to offer today perhaps a different way of seeing a different way of approaching writing methods paper that draws on an approach called genre theory, which I'm going to go through. Some of the things that we are not going to focus on today 
we're not going to focus on how to do research or reviews. Some of the other great Atlas TI, IQM webinars can help with that. Nor are we going to focus on how to write engagingly, clearly, or concisely. Things like spelling and grammar and style. There are some really good books that we'll cover at the end that can help with that. Nor indeed are we going to debate many, many of these wonderful, fascinating methods issues. But what we are going to focus on is how to approach methods writing and to consider what makes a good methods paper. Thinking in particular about five considerations that you can have, five steps to success, and also some pitfalls to avoid. And then finally, we're going to have some notes in the margin. We're going to have some considerations for general publishing in relation to methods that you might want to be aware of as you move forward. Okay, so here we go. Chapter one, approaching methods writing. How should we understand the task of writing methods papers? Well, when we think about writing, we often think like this. We think about what we have to say. We think about that in quite a standard way in terms of our writing. And we can write in a direct but fairly non-differentiated way whereby in our minds and through our writing we are focused on trying to get our methods across in relation to what we want to say. But I want to think of writing a little bit differently. And in particular, I want to think of writing methods papers a little bit differently. Positioning ourselves in a different way in relation to our right and as writers. To think of method writing as one of a range of different kinds of writing that we would do that's special and distinctive and different. A particular type of writing that has its own particular characteristics and style and techniques that we can more consciously hone. So when we think about writing in this very uh, distinctive way, we're going to write different ways for different journals. We're going to write different ways, different methods for different journals. Instead of writing very generically, focusing in particular on how we can be most responsive to our audience, how we can be most mindful about our methods messages, and very purposive in our selection of our journals. And when we approach writing in this way, we are far more responsive to context, the distinctive journal we're writing for, the distinctive methodological messages we're trying to convey, but for the distinctive audiences involved. And this is an approach to writing that's very much genre-based. It's based on thinking about carefully how we would write in different ways for different audiences, for different journals, for different purposes. Here, for example, are some of the journals that I've written for over the these journals have their very preference, their style of writing based on their different audiences. They have what they like, they have what they don't like. And my job as a writer is to try to connect with the audiences and the readerships of these journals in a way that best responds to the nature of the writing in those journals. And when we're thinking about writing in this way, this genre-based way, we think of writing in lots of different ways. And I'm sure some of you already today have written emails, some of you have written tweets, some of you have written text messages. These are all very, very different types of writing. Some of you who have maybe been doing academic work will have been writing grant reviews or letters to the editor. Some of you who are writing publications may have been writing qualitative findings papers or meta-analysis findings papers or regression analyses. But in particular, I want to think today of that distinctive writing style and that distinctive type of writing that we're going to call methods writing. And we're going to approach it as a distinctive kind of genre. Okay, just a couple more things then before we move on about how we approach writing. Some of us can think about writing and methods writing in particular a bit like this. We see it as something that's super, super creative super, super toil, uh, toiling 
and very, very intellectual. And I want to challenge you to think methods writing less like this and more like this. More mundane, more clear, and more procedural. And we shouldn't over-intellectualize this kind of writing. Furthermore, I'd like us to think of three key concepts in relation to this writing, whereby we think of knowledge communities, scholarly conversations, and reviewers and editors. What do these things mean? Knowledge communities are distinctive groups of individuals, which may include academics, but also other types of uh, professionals or members of the public, in broad social groups as defined by an overlapping shared interest. So for example, there's a knowledge community that I connect to that's interested in heart failure self-care. Different professional groups located all over the world, from PhD students all the way through to senior professors, practicing cardiologists to nurses to pharmacists, patient representatives, government agencies, all defined by a shared interest in heart failure self-care. And when I write papers for that group, I'm focused very consciously on the shared knowledge community, defined by that shared focus on heart failure self-care. And when we are writing for journals, we are always writing for defined knowledge communities. Sometimes scholars have called these disciplinary communities. In methods, there are a number of different knowledge communities. And these knowledge communities are having scholarly conversations. They're having scholarly conversations in different and in different ways. They're having discussions at conferences through conference papers. They're having discussions on Twitter. They're having discussions in corridors. They're having discussions also through journal articles. So knowledge communities are having scholarly conversations. These conversations are happening in lots of different ways in relation to topics of interest to the knowledge communities. And like all conversations, some things are said and some things are not said. Some things are assumed. Some things are too heretical or controversial to even be said. And within these scholarly conversations, some voices are loud and say lots. Some voices are loud, say lots, but actually say little. And some voices say little, but themselves say a lot. Scholarly conversations are going on all the time in lots of different places. And our job as writers is to tap into these conversations and very, very clearly add value to them. And in methods communities, we have scholarly conversations going on all the time. And these conversations tend to be strongly international. We can have methods communities who are interested in particular platforms, like qualitative research harnessing Twitter. There's methods communities in qualitative research interested particularly in elements of identity or culture. There's methods communities in quality to research who are more interested in theory or more interested, for example, in procedural elements of visual data collection. So when we are writing, we are writing to particular knowledge communities. These communities are having scholarly conversations and they can be different conversations focused on very different things to do with methods. And our job is to try and understand these conversations to listen to them, make sense of them, and then over time make active contributions to them. This can be really quite challenging because the conversations don't necessarily initially make sense. And those of us who are early stage PhD students, master students, or can remember back to that, can remember how vast and messy literatures used to be, how vast and messy those scholarly conversations used to be and how difficult it can be to make sense of them. But our job in the early stages of our career is to try and listen, to try and make sense and make some sort of order of what's going on in terms of these scholarly conversations. And as we advance in our research, 
we are then thinking far more pointedly about making contributions to those conversations. What can we add? What can we say to synthesize and make a difference to the conversations so that we've got something useful to say that is distinctive and also adds value? So these scholarly conversations are going on all the time. Often those conversations are going on in journals. Now, unlike elements of social media, those conversations are a little bit more regulated. They're regulated by people like this, who are editors, who can regulate and gatekeep those papers, those authors, who are allowed to make contributions to the scholarly conversations. As well as editors, of course, we have reviewers, those people who are charged with saying and assessing, is there something being said here in this paper that's distinctive, that's useful, that adds value? And these reviewers effectively, along with editors, are gatekeepers to the scholarly conversations that are going on around. So this is how we're going to approach methods writing. And now we're going to think in a little bit more detail about what makes a good methods paper and some key strategies around this that you can take forward for your own methods paper. Thinking very carefully, in particular, about steps for success. So what are first steps for success? Number one. Well, duh, it's methods. This sounds self-evident, but you'd be actually very surprised the number of articles as an editor that I see purporting to focus on methods that actually focuses on things, on substance either excessively or exclusively. So when we are writing about methods, most pointedly, we have to be focused on methods and ensuring that our papers report sufficient methodological advances to be useful to people from different disciplines, to scholarly conversations that are going on in different bodies of theory in different places, no matter where the members of those scholarly conversations are in the world. So we have to get the balance right between the substance of our work and the methods in our work. For sure, you can use elements of research findings to illustrate methods, but often in our methodological writing where the substance is too strong and the methods too secondary, the paper ultimately ceases to be a methods paper and becomes a paper focus on substance. And this is a common but great mistake. Number two, what we're going to call the fit bit. So what is the fit bit? Well, the issue around the fit bit is you have to know what journals like which means you have to know your journals, firstly, and secondly, you have to know what those journals like. So often in our research careers, we only know some of the journals in our fields. We don't necessarily know all the journals, and we've not really tuned into what those journals really, really like. Why is this a problem? Well, can you imagine going into a restaurant and thinking, well, I want to pick the dish on the menu that's most suited to my preferences, the thing that I'm going to most like, but you cover half the menu up. And this is the equivalent of having an article that you want to publish and not having a comprehensive knowledge of as many of the possible journals you can publish that in as possible. Effectively, you are reducing your own choice and functioning where you want to make the best choice, but covering half the choices up that you could possibly choose from. So key lesson here is we have to know our journals. We have to know the full range of journals that we could possibly publish our paper in. Thirdly, we have to think about the fit of our paper with those journals. And journals have their own predilections, their own genres that we have to really tune into there. And this is akin to developing your ear. 
your ear for a new type of music, tuning into the preferences, the nuances of particular journals around methods. So, for example, let's look at three journals that are common in relation to methods publishing. First of all, Social Science and Medicine, which is the most cited social science journal in the world, and they publish methods papers. This journal is quite traditional, has extensive word limits, very, very international readership, but has a certain style of writing that's different than other kinds of journals, like the Qualitative Health Research Journal, or indeed the International Journal of Qualitative Methodology. So when we think about writing, we don't just think about writing generically. We don't just think about writing in terms of methods papers. We think about writing methods papers for a particular journal that serves a particular scholarly conversation and knowledge community. How do we tune into this? Well, it's important to see the journals and understand the ways that they can vary. And journals in this sense that are different have different preferences around what they like. They have different rhythms. There's a different feel to the articles in the different journals. And those journals also have appearance differences. Papers are written up differently in the different journals in different ways. And it's our job as writers to try and tune into these differences and write our manuscripts so that we respond to them. And if we don't respond well to the nature of those journals, there can be a real lack of fit. And this is a problem because then our paper appears quite jarring when it's submitted to the journal and to the reviewers and editors of that journal in a way that makes it feel it doesn't really belong there. And this is the equivalent, for example, in relation to those journals, as going to the rap music concert in your opera music outfit. You're not going with a responsive, thoughtful, mindful approach that really matches how you're presenting your work to the work that's been published in that journal before. And so there's a lack of fit there that's really problematic. And we don't want that. We don't want to be the person who turns up to the Vegetarian Society barbecue with the plate full of sausages. Unsurprisingly, we will be deemed not to fit. How can you judge this then? Well, read the journals, look at the web pages, check very, very carefully the aims and the scope of those journals. Look at past issues, look at the type of qualitative research methods articles that have been published there. Look at how they're presented. Look at what knowledge is assumed. Look at what wording is used to frame the issues. If you are not sure if a journal is going to be interested in your methods paper, email editor. Editors are friendly people. They deal with these kind of inquiries all the time. And it's important because editors have space to fit and they want to fit it with good work. Don't ever forget that. But that work they expect to fit. They expect that work to be responsive to their readers, the scholarly conversations that are important to them, and the knowledge communities that they make up. So that's the fit bit. Okay, on to number three. Number three is, well, what are you saying? What's your key messages? And I don't know if you've ever been to a party and had a situation like this situation where someone is talking to you and they're talking and they're talking and they're talking but you know what they've got nothing new to say they've got nothing interesting to say they've got nothing clear to say they just talk and talk and talk now I'd like to point out here you may have seen a photograph earlier on this picture here is not me any similarity is entirely coincidental here. I am not that party bore, no matter what you might hear. We don't want to be the party bore. 
We want to be the people who are having conversations and very, very clearly articulating what we have that's new and different and relevant and exciting to say. A new and different and relevant contribution. A contribution that perhaps sees an old problem in a new way or a new methodological problem in an old way. But without a doubt, there's no dubiety that what we're addressing is hot, is relevant, is energizing, and can contribute something useful to a scholarly conversation that's important to the knowledge community of that journal. One of the biggest problems here that we see in papers is just not clear what the main messages are. And it's just not clear what the author's angle is. And that's really, really difficult when you're reading a paper and you can't quite get the sense of what the main contributions of that paper are. So you have to be very clear when you're writing your methods paper. What's your take on the literature? And what's your take on the contribution? And you don't want to be like the party bore where you have nothing interesting nothing clear, nothing exciting, and nothing new and novel to say. Number four. Number four is write great. And when you read lots of academic papers, you do get a sense that we may not be the best qualitative research analysts in the world. There's a certain trend when we read academic papers. The writing can be very tedious difficult to grasp what's going on, long sentences, long prose. And I'd like to introduce this concept to you of the magic number. What's the magic number? Well, the magic number is 85%. What does this mean? Well, if you look at the systematic review carried out by the author Helen Sword, you will identify that 85% of academic papers are not clear, are not concise, and are not engaging. I'm just going to repeat that for you. 85% of academic papers are not clear, not concise, and they are not engaging. And I think this is really sad. But it's also really surprising. It's the quintessential whiskey tango foxtrot moment because writing is the recurrent practice we are told of academia. Writing is central to what we do as researchers in so many ways in relation to publications. But when we do write and we don't write clearly and we don't write concisely and we're not engaging, we're doing a real disservice to this thing that we say is so central to what we're about. We show a lack of care for this thing that we say is really important to us. And I don't know why that's the case. What we'd rather see is prose that hooks and sparkles and excites and is vibrant, prose that shows clearly how it can help a bemused, confused, eager reader, being very clear about what value it adds and what contribution it makes that's so vital, and does this in a way that really connects, that connects to the knowledge communities that are relevant for those scholarly conversations in ways where it doesn't matter if you're from a different discipline, a different career stage, or a different background. The author's done the work to make that prose connect with you. Number four, we need to write well. Okay, number five. And number five is about adding value and appreciating value. You have to develop a sense of 
the strength of your methods paper and how you can maximize the strength of that methods paper in what you write. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we have to think of the distinctive ways that methods papers can add value. What effectively is methods? Well, methods papers can come in a variety of different forms. They can be addressing big macro issues to do with methodology. New approaches, for example, to phenomenology, to grounded theory, or new approaches to rigor. They can also be smaller. Methods papers can address elements of design, micro things to do with sampling, to do with rigor, or to do with analysis. Methods papers can also be focused on very specific things, particular problems, or particular techniques that you've developed in your work. How did you respond, for example, to sampling challenges you had in relation to a particular vulnerable or marginalized population? But irrespective of the focus of our work, we are focused in our methods papers on helping others and appreciating and understanding the value of what we do in particular to these others, making clear, communicating, connecting the value in our paper to the needs, preferences of those different knowledge communities. A useful post from a recent blog on this came from Pat Thompson, and she provided some really useful criteria for how to judge high value in publications. Thinking about your work and understanding how it pushes the field forward. Being very clear and pointedly showing the significance and nature of your contribution. Making sure you convey a deep understanding of the international literatures, histories, and debates within your field. Ensuring that your writing has an authoritative voice. It may or may not challenge traditions in existing genres, provide persuasive evidence and or argument for your methodological contribution and is potentially of wide interest, sometimes wider than we would readily anticipate. This is important in terms of really adding value to your work that you consider all the possible potential knowledge communities and scholarly conversations that your methods paper can contribute to. And in this way, it is something you create. Your methods paper doesn't have an inherent value per se, it has a value that you can co-create by taking the material and the insights and really making it work for you and connect all the many different audiences and needs that might exist out there within the various scholarly conversations. This process can be hard, but it is one very much of co-creation and you have to get creative around it. One of the things that we do within IIQM is uh, workshops, in particular, about marketing your academic papers. Selling your papers is useful and important contributions to scholarly conversations for a defined knowledge community. This is an approach called the market approach. And the market approach involves a number of key elements involved with clearly using simple language, concisely using few words, and being engaging to connect your messages around what your paper's main contribution are to an important scholarly conversation. If you don't know what your main messages are, you can't expect the reader or the editor or the reviewer to know those for you. You need to have, when you do write, a very clear sense of what the key messages are from your paper. Ideally, a maximum only of three, and being very mindful in your considerations of the audience, their concerns and their language in relation to the relevant scholarly conversation. You want to connect very pointedly to knowledge communities. The knowledge communities audience that are having the conversation that you wish to contribute to. Probably you can only think of one or two of these at any one go, but you have to think of those that are most appropriate, most amenable to your messages. And then coming back to our earlier point, is you have to know your journals. And you have to identify the main places in which the scholarly conversation you're interested to contribute to is taking place. 
ideally specifying only one to two to three and writing specifically for those journals. Not writing the paper first and then selecting journals as an afterthought, but have that journal selection up front so that you can then write your paper with that specific journal, that specific knowledge community, and that specific scholarly conversation in mind. Drawing these points together, a quick exercise you can do as you start to think about your methods ideas is the so what, who cares test. Take two minutes and explain your methods papers to a colleague, a student, a faculty member, a supervisor, and get that person to really carefully consider what Kamala and Thompson argued are the two key points in relation to methods papers. So what? Who cares? Can you really convey and explain the significance of your methods paper, why it's important, and who it's important to? in a way that's clear, in a way that's concise, and also in a way that is engaging. It's a really great challenge and a really fun thing to try. So, they are our strategies for success. What then about our possible pitfalls? The things we can do that potentially can go wrong and harm the chances of our paper being accepted, also reduce the quality of it in terms of how it's written and its connection to that scholarly conversation and knowledge community. While we already addressed one of these earlier on, this issue of fit, whereby if we're not attuned to the journals that we're writing for, the knowledge communities that they serve and the scholarly conversations that are going on there, when we write, it's really a bit of a shot in the dark as to whether we are going to fit and whether we're going to look like our paper really belongs in that journal and really addresses the scholarly conversation that that knowledge community is having. Some of the other challenges relate to some of the things that we talked about around messages, that the main methods messages in the paper are lost or too numerous or indeed are very meh. There's significance it's really just not apparent. And what can we do about these things? Well, certainly in my experience, when I'm not clear when I'm writing about the main messages I have, or I can't nail the order of those messages down in the most appropriate way, I, for example, would take a two-page PowerPoint and just try to write down the main messages on that two-page PowerPoint and play with the order of them to the point where I will wait and see if the point at which they tell the most compelling, persuasive, connecting story about the paper, why it's significant, and why it's important to the relevant knowledge community. So you can try different things here, talking to other people, sharing your ideas, writing a draft, or telling a story like on a two-page PowerPoint like that can all be helpful. Other pitfalls, well, you fail to find your audience, that when you're writing, you are not writing with a defined knowledge community or scholarly conversation in mind. And this is really a question about connection. You have to really be very pointedly writing for a knowledge community and connecting your methods paper very directly to an important scholarly conversation that you are then adding value to that you are making an important and distinctive contribution to. What next then? Oh, that the arguments for your contribution are not clear or don't flow. And again, this can be an issue of all the notes are there in your paper, but not necessarily in the right order. And again, talking to other colleagues, talking to other researchers, sharing your paper, sharing your ideas can really help you. Sometimes the ideas, the flow in our minds is not the one that makes the best sense for other people. I've always find it's been good when I'm writing particularly challenging methods papers is to share those methods papers with people from different disciplines and different backgrounds and getting their feedback. And I find very rapidly when I do that sometimes the things that I thought were communicated clearly or flowed 
my readers don't agree with that. And so prior to your submission of your article, think about sharing it with some trusted other people. Getting feedback and being receptive to the feedback that you're given, particularly when that feedback is from people from maybe different backgrounds, different disciplines, and can help you identify the right way to make your paper flow and ensure that its contributions are most clear. So there are some of the pitfalls. So we're going to close up now and we're going to do some notes in the margin here just before we finish. And the notes in the margin here, we're going to focus on three main areas. We're going to focus on predatory journals, open access, and publishing strategies. So first of all, predatory journals. And I'm sure many of you receive emails unsolicited from journals asking you to submit your papers to them. This can be very nice because we think people are interested in our work. We're glad that our people are taking an interest and not only taking an interest, actively submission of our research to their journals. The problem here is the motivations behind that. And predatory journals are owned by predatory publishers. The main aim of these publishers being to make money. To make money at your expense, at the expense of your scholarship and your reputation. And you have to be careful when you publish in predatory journals, in particular because these papers stand out and don't look good on CV. They're not only a neutral, they're really a negative. So we don't want to publish in predatory journals. It can be difficult, though, to tell which journals are good and which journals are bad in terms of whether they're predatory. Things you can do to try and identify this Assess if the journal has a well-known editorial board. Does it have good peer review? Does the journal have an impact factor? You can also use this well-known list of predatory publishers published by this gentleman called Beale. That's the web address there for Beale's list of predatory publishers. And you can access this link and assess and look at the list of publishers and if your publisher of your potential paper is listed there, then you should be very careful. And I would say, please, please use this list. It's accurate, it's up-to-date, and it's scholarly, and it's the most definitive source that you can use to identify if a journal or publisher is predatory. Open access. Open access generally is a good thing. It democratizes knowledge. It makes knowledge accessible wherever you are in the world to whoever, irrespective of the ability to pay. It can be challenging because for researchers, there's often fees involved. So when you're writing a paper for an open access journal, you'll often be asked to pay a fee to ensure that your paper can be made open access to that journal. One way to get around this is also to use a library or university institutional repository. And these repositories exist whereby you can post a pre-publication copy of your finalized paper to the repository. And by doing that, you are ensuring you are adhering to open access requirements that many funders now have in place. Your university librarian or your dean or head of department will be able to tell you if there's an institutional repository at your institution. If you have one, please consider using it because along with open access, it too democratizes knowledge, makes knowledge available to everyone in the world, irrespective of the ability to pay. Okay, final note in the margin. Think about developing, in particular, a conscious publication strategy in relation to your work. This is really important because scholarship can vary in lots of different ways in terms of published outputs. We can make decisions about how much we want to publish, the quantity we publish, the quality of the work we publish, and the visibility of the work we publish too. And trade-offs between quantity in particular and quality are really interesting and important in terms of our scholarly careers. Methods papers, form an important adjunct to many of the substantive papers we can publish. And I would say represent a really good added value to your work 
that you don't necessarily get when you just publish substantively. So methods papers can be important for our publishing strategies and help us reconcile these difficult issues between quantity, quality, and visibility. Okay. Well, looking at the time here, things are getting on. It's time for the final countdown. And turning things back to you. Turning back to your idea for your methods paper that we started off with at the beginning of this session. To think of writing in a different style. To think of writing methods papers as a particular kind of writing. To think of writing methods papers for particular journals as a particular kind of writing. Contributing to a scholarly conversation for a defined knowledge communities. And thinking in particular about some of the strategies that we talked about that can increase our chances of success and also increase our chances of identifying relevant, useful, and non-predatory journals to publish our methods papers in. Remember our five tips? We want to focus not on substantive things, but methods. We want to really work on the fit of what we write to the journals that we're writing for. We don't want to be the party bore with nothing new, interesting, or distinctive to say. We have to be good at adding value and be good at connecting our methods work to different readerships, to different knowledge communities, and adding value to our work by appreciating its strengths and maximizing those strengths in what we write. If you're interested in some of the work around writing that we talked about during this webinar, some recommended texts for you. Stylish Academic Writing by Helen Sword, fantastic book. Writing for peer-reviewed journals by Pat Thompson and Barbara Kamla, along with other books, offer as an amazing resource to think about writing differently and maximize the quality of your writing. Think about accessing the wonderful blog by Pat Thompson, which every few days has interesting considerations, thoughts, and approaches to really focus on the quality of your writing. I hope as you consider and continue your methodological writing, you'll think about the International Journal of Qualitative Methodology. But in particular, you will remain focused on your ideas, sharing your ideas, connecting your ideas, so that you can continue to contribute to the global qualitative methodology experience of the global community of qualitative researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a wonderful presentation. Lots of helpful tips in there. If anyone has any questions for Alex at this time, you can raise your hand and I will give you the microphone. If you don't have a microphone, then you can write your questions and we'll read them off the bottom. So, and before you ask your question, if you can just tell us who you are and where you're from, that would be great. So we do have someone who has their hand raised here. Hamlata Chari, I'm going to give you the microphone if you want to ask your question. Okay, if you don't have access to a microphone, you can just type your question in the bottom. Okay, I guess they don't have a microphone or a question. So is anyone else, you can just raise your hand or type your question at the bottom in the chat. Okay, so we do have a question here from Yuko Asada. Thank you for your presentation, Yuka, Yuka from University of Illinois at Chicago. Can you please provide one or two exemplary method manuscripts that we can review? Sure, Yuka. Um, if you want to send me an email, 
you can see my email address there in the bottom right hand corner. I'd be glad to send you some really good um, examples of um, strong methodological manuscripts. Uh, again, you know, what does a strong methodological manuscript do? Well, it's clear, it's concise, it's engaging, and it really contributes something useful to a relevant methodological issue. So, for example, one paper that comes to mind from my experience from the International Journal of Qualitative Methods was a paper by Jude Spires that offered a very clear, well-rounded conception of rigor in qualitative research and built on debates around rigor dating back to the earlier work from Denzin and Lincoln, but provided a more contemporary, more artistic, a more, I would say, uh, more intellectually well-rounded view of rigor in qualitative research that really moved conceptions of rigor forward. Again, building on the past conversation around rigor, the relevant topic, being clear on what value it added to that work, and also being fairly easy to follow, well-referenced, but very clear in how it communicated why its contributions were important. And that's the paper by Jude Spires in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods on Rigor. Okay, great. We've got another question here from Velna Clark Arno. My name is Velna. My question is, how do I use Indigenous methodology in writing a systematic review? Well, oh, that's a very specific question, Velma. Um, I think uh, that's not my topic of expertise. The best approach you could do would be to look at what other um, researchers have worked in this area, contact them, or look at previous publications of indigenous methods within qualitative and mixed methods research. They are out there, not only in countries like Canada, but also in Australia. Um, again, if you want to send me an email, I'd be glad to link you to some indigenous scholars who would be able to identify some of the historical work that's been done in that area. It's very important work, and I would encourage you to do it. Okay, we've got another question from Shintaro. You've got your hand raised. I'm going to try to give you the microphone. Hello, Shintaro. Hi there. Yeah, you can go ahead and ask your question. Awesome. Um, Dr. Clark, thank you for the presentation. It was very helpful. Um, should I go ahead or? Yeah, you can go ahead and ask go your ahead. question. Oh, cool. Um, so my question is, um, I'm planning to write a method paper that is specifically based on literature review of major journals in my field. Um, specifically about how certain methodology granted theory has been used in our field. And uh, I was wondering if you have any comments specific to that kind of methods paper, method paper based on literature review. Thanks. Okay. Really good question, Shintaro. And thank you for your feedback on the webinar. Um, where you are making an argument in your paper about how an approach has been used it's really important for you to know your literature. To not have a partial or a very one-sided view of how that approach has been used, but have a comprehensive understanding. So for example, people like this, it would be justifiable to work with the librarian and develop a comprehensive search strategy to identify all the relevant papers published in a field using that grounded theory approach and trying to document that comprehensively. This addresses a common issue I see in methods papers and qualitative research papers generally, whereby researchers don't always present a comprehensive knowledge of the literature. They ignore relevant studies. They don't describe or convey a full planning scope of past research in the field. So that would be my main tip in relation to this work, Shitaro. Make sure you look comprehensively. Think about working with a librarian to help you do that, because they can be really helpful in ensuring that you're using the right databases and that you are indeed developing and building your contribution on a comprehensive understanding of what has been published. 
Okay, and we've got another question here from Amina Mevawala. How do we identify the quality of a journal or the impact factor of a journal? So this is an interesting question, Amina. Um, impact factor um, doesn't directly equate with quality, but journals that have impact factors tend to have to have a certain level of rejection rate, they must have an active editorial board as well. So if a journal has an impact factor, usually some indication that they are quality. I think quality is very much something that's reputational and a lot depends what field you're working in. But developing your knowledge culturally of the higher reputation journals within your field is really important. Um, so, for example, some of us work in clinical areas like cardiology. Others work in theoretical areas, for example, like ethnography. Um, but knowing within your particular knowledge community what journals are seen to be the really strong ones and really trying to target those with your work, particularly your strongest work, making sure, as I've said, that there's a clear sense of what your paper can contribute to the relevant scholarly conversations that are happening in the right places. So whilst they're not the same, they're close links, but I would suggest that you really try and identify within your mentorship field and within your um, field of colleagues and supervisors which journals are the best regarded and target those. Okay, and we've got another question from Alan Aiken. I'll give you the microphone if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Ah, good evening from Scotland. Um, I hope you don't struggle too much with my accent, Alex, but uh, listening to yours, I don't think you will. <laughs> um, I note that uh, most of the key references that you've given are obviously from your own health-based discipline. Uh, my question is, to what extent does the target discipline influence the, the choice of, of journal of methods journal, um, for example, would IJQM encourage methods related to, say, business management? Thanks, Alan. It's a great question. Um, some journals are more um, obviously discipline specific. So if you look at qualitative health research, they would be interested in methods, but within the realm of health. Whereas journals like the International Journal of Qualitative Methods are cross-disciplinary, they're interdisciplinary. Um, so any discipline that uses qualitative or mixed methods can potentially publish their methods papers there. And it's one of the distinctive or unique things about that journal. Other journals within qualitative research that are similar, so for example, um, there's a journal with published by SAGE called Qualitative Research and there's also another journal called Qualitative Inquiry. And based on my knowledge, no matter what discipline you're coming from, those kinds of journals will be interested in your methodological work. It all comes back to the initial point of know your journals. Okay, and we have another question here from Avril Nickel. I'll give you the microphone. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Avril, do you have a microphone? Okay, I'm guessing not. You can write your question down in the question field. We do have another one from Susan. Susan, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, she might not have access to a uh, microphone either. So our question, I'm part of a group working on qualitative methods in a particular field. Most of the literature is substantive, not methodological in focus. Any ideas on strategies to understand the methods in this area with so little focus on methods? Is that Susan's question? Yes. Well, Susan, that's a, that's a difficult position to be in. Um, and in some fields are less well developed in terms of methods than others. Um, I think you can make a contribution. It may be a preliminary contribution. Um, or it may even be a contribution that draws attention to the lack of methodological focus on work thus far. 
which in itself, I think probably in the early stages, would be one of the most useful contributions you could make. Um, so I would say do what you can. Um, use good literature searching skills, like I mentioned to Shatiro earlier on, whereby you're searching comprehensively working with a librarian, and then start to draw attention in your knowledge community to the lack of methodological work and start to be part of the solution to make some of those preliminary methodological steps. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. And I think that's all the questions we have now. If anyone thinks of any other questions they have, the information to reach uh, Dr. Clark is at the bottom of your screen. On behalf of Atlas TI and IIQM, Alex, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today. Our next webinar will be on April 14th at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Our presenter will be Catherine Wilston and she'll be speaking on qualitative interviews reconsidered. You can also go to the IIQM webpage, iiqm.ualberta.ca, and check out the events that we have coming up in Glasgow. May 1st to 5th, we have the Qualitative Methods Conference, and registration is still open for that event. As well, coming up here in Edmonton, we have the Thinking Qualitatively Workshop Series taking place from June 20th to 24th. So hopefully we'll see you at one of those two events. Alex, any closing words? Just uh, thank everyone for their time. Good luck with your methods papers. Um, you're making wonderful contributions. Make it happen. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye.